We're back. I on the Illini. I thought it would be an hour or two, but you know what? We're dealing with Matt Stevens. It's not going to be an hour or two. It's going to be right away. So, uh, really Matt want a two hour drive to Portland and Mike Cagley. So yeah, yeah it's going to be an hour. Trust me. <laughs> well, I had told people it <laughs> might be a couple hours before you were ready and you've turned the tables. Let's talk a little bit about this game, a challenging game. I mean, I think it's safe to say that the Illini started off a little slow. How important was the ability to tackle? Because I will tell you, I thought that the one moment that people aren't going to talk about a lot is it was the first third down of the game. And I don't remember who missed the tackle, but guy popped free, got a first down, and then they drove the rest of the way. But there was a shot Illinois could have had Oregon with a three and out. Now, I want to be real clear. I don't know that that would have made any difference in the outcome. But, boy, if it was nothing more than foreshadowing, that was a bad foreshadow. Oregon got three third down conversions on the first drive of the game where they made it 7 nothing, including, I think, I believe, either the play before or the play of the touchdown pass to Tez Johnson, which you mentioned the tackling. Um, you got to get there first before you can make yeah. the tackle, right? And I, I keep going back to the first drive of the game, the first touchdown, okay? That is a pass, short pass to the middle of the field to Tez Johnson, where Gabe Yakis is in the middle of the field being asked to make the open field tackle on a guy who has NFL speed um, and is going to play on Sundays because of his speed. It's not because of his size and it's not because of his athleticism. It's because of his speed. Um, that is that is not an advantageous position for Illinois defense to be in. And Oregon figured that out very, very quickly. Imagine getting being I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this. I think he's very, very talented um, and he's. He's been, you know, a, a power five conference quarterback for quite a while now, either at, at either at Oklahoma or at, or now at Oregon. But imagine being Dylan Gabriel and you're going to get a free trip to New York and potentially the Heisman Trophy by throwing three and four yard passes like and allowing your teammates to do the work for you. I mean, that's that's got to be comforting. Um, and, and the reason that Oregon is and Dylan Gabriel is able to do that is because they have so much speed out on the perimeter and they are going to say, hey, look. We don't think you can tackle us out in the open field, and until you prove that we do, we're not going to adjust. And that's kind of the way that the first half went down. They threw the ball out to the perimeter or in the middle of the field, and Illinois did not make open field tackles. And and that's, you know, I could pinpoint a whole bunch of guys on this defense, but there's 11 of them, and I think that Oregon figured out that if we get them in one, if we get any of these 11 guys in one on ones, they're not going to be able to make the play. And um, you know, it's, it kind of leads into my column that's, that's up on IlliniGuys.com right now. Like Oregon over the last few years, especially under Dan Lanning, has recruited dudes with a capital D, and Illinois has not. And that's why Oregon's number one in the country. That's why Oregon has a shot to win the national title. And quite frankly, Illinois likely does not. They, they, are, they, they are two different levels right now. And, and, and I want to applaud Illinois and Brett Bielema for the job that they've done in rebuilding this program to get it to where it is. But if you look behind, like, let's imagine it being a road to travel, okay? And Illinois looks behind them right now. There's a long distance from where they came. And then they look straight ahead, and, boy, there's a long distance to get to Oregon. And and so, you know, again, this is just an example of Illinois being, you know, the the, on the path, but but so far – so like getting, they are so far away from getting to like an Oregon or Ohio State or even make a Penn State right now, just in terms of athleticism and in terms of um, what they're asking their two and three star players that they develop to do against four and five star guys that can run all down day. day. And, and that's what Oregon is. And, and I'm not going to limit the idea that Dan Lanning and Tosh Leopold and, and, and Will Stein do a really good job in their in their coaching boxes and they're in, their, in, in developing their talent because they really, really do. Um, but they start off with guys that are that are NFL bound and, and Illinois, you know, at a, at a if there's 105 guys in the Illinois roster. Most of them are not NFL bound. And so uh, I'm not suggesting that 105 Oregon players are NFL bound, but they're starting 22 there. There's going to be a lot of their dudes that play on Sunday, especially um, at the line of scrimmage, just simply because of their athleticism. They're not specifically bigger than Illinois, but they're a hell of a lot more athletic on the offense, offense and defensive line too. So, um, but yeah, I, I just felt like this was a game that Oregon, at least as in the first quarter, Mike, Oregon put the game out in space, and Illinois could not have a better, could not have asked for something less. Which is, they needed this game to be played in a phone booth, and Oregon wanted it to play it out in the parking lot. And and in Eugene, 
they figured out a way to get it in the parking lot and, and um, kind of mystified this Illinois defense for the better part of the first probably 18 minutes of play. So how much of this realistically do you think was just Illinois adjusting to the incredible speed that literally, I swear the water boy looked like he was faster than Illinois' water boy. Because to me, there were guys that are usually pretty sure tacklers who took horrible pursuit angles. And the only thing that I've got is, is sometimes you have to take the measure of the other man and find out how much faster he is than you so that you could adjust your pursuit route. And I, I, I don't know, maybe even Illinois struggled with playing like Oregon in, in practice, you know, in, in foot, in basketball, you add a sixth guy on defense to emulate a team right. that's really good defensively. Did it, did Illinois just have a hard time adjusting to the, the physical talent in terms of pure speed? Was that part of it too? It's kind of hard for their Illinois look team to be able to simulate Oregon speed, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I, I feel like this was a game in which, yeah, I feel like for, for seven games, they were six and one before today. Illinois did a really, really good job. Even in the Penn State game, Mike, I thought they did a really good job of open field tackling, especially in the secondary. Right? You, you, you didn't see a. Whole, they missed five tackles last last week against Michigan. Five. Okay. Um, they. I, I looked at it in the first quarter because it just came to my mind. Um, they had fifty five tackles missed throughout the first seven games of the year. That's that's a pretty darn good number. I mean, like, um, I got it. That's that's eight tackles missed per game. That's not going to kill you, okay? Um, I feel like they had eight tackles missed by the first quarter, and, and Illinois tried to to uh, simulate that fifty five in the first thirty minutes of the game. Like, I, I just I don't know. Like, it, it, it's 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 got to be hard for Miles Scott to simulate the speed of Oregon like it, throughout the week. It's got to be hard. And then, oh by the way. You know, you lose – I think they lost three defensive secondary starters to injury. I know that uh, Caleb Patterson walked, you know, walked off the field. Uh, I know that uh, uh, the, the two the two nickels, uh, Corey, Corey Cox and Tyler Strain, both walked off the field with injuries. And now you're playing dudes that, that, are, that are really, really young and, and you weren't planning on playing for 40-plus snaps. And they've got to make open field tackles, and, and Oregon, you know, exploited that. Um, but I also feel like even when they were at full strength in the first quarter, Illinois didn't make – you know, Miles Scott usually makes tackles like that. Xavier Scott usually makes tackles like that. He missed them. Caleb Patterson usually makes tackles like that. He missed them. Um, you know, Matt Bailey usually makes tackles like that. He, there were times where he missed them. Um, so Matt Bailey usually run plugs a little bit better than he did today. Um so I felt like the first 18 minutes, this defense was just, you know, spinning. I mean, they were on roller skates. And, and, and I didn't feel like Illinois got good footing except for the three and out that they got after Luke threw the pick, the mind-numbing pick that I don't understand. Like, I, I guess Luke was trying to simulate a punt. Or, or he just didn't understand the coverage, as Brett Bielema said, because that was an arm punt that that the Oregon guy just yeah. near fair caught. Um, so – I, I'm struggling to find answers on this one because I felt like, again, short of the second half against Purdue um, and maybe the first half today, Illinois' defense has been pretty solid. Um, and they just they, – they really haven't – you know, they've, they've since coming out of that bye week, there's something going on here. And, and um, the tackling is not on point and, and the assignments aren't on point. And now you're starting to get injuries and you're starting to play guys that probably – uh, you weren't counting on on August 1st. So, um, you know, if November is to be a month to be remembered, as Brett Bielema always talks about, you're going to have to get a whole lot better on that side of the ball, especially at the start of games. And it was just uh, – it was it was a little bit confounding as to why Illinois started out the first 18 minutes of this game the way they did. And, and, and you combine that with Oregon being the number one team in the country, and you can kind of now at that point see why Illinois was down 21 to nothing, like, you know, in a Linda Blinkman eye. Yeah, and they had – they had their opportunities, but you know those. The, again, you there's just no room for me, for mistakes when you're playing a team as talented as what um, as what Oregon is. And and I'm I'm blanking on the name of the defensive uh, the the outside rusher for Penn State who just dominated with his speed. Right, uh, Abdul Carter. 
Yes, and I, I felt like I was watching a bunch of Abdul Carters out there with the overall speed. I don't think they're as, as big as Penn State. I'm not certain. No, they're not. But, they, but they're faster. They're faster than, than anybody and maybe even faster than Ohio State. I mean, that team is fast. Well, they go to, I mean, look, like the fact of the matter is I wrote about it in the column. Like they, they go, they go to Texas, they go to Florida and they go to California to go get nothing other than speed. That's where they, that's their, that's, that's their speed clinic is we go to California, we go to Texas and we go to Florida um, because high school football here in the state of Oregon stinks. And, they, and they've known that for the better part of four decades now here, here in Eugene. So um, this national brand has gone to those places to go get speed and you saw it in their I would say they're I would say they're 22 on defense because I think their their second string on defense is just as fast or just not as experienced. Um, and so it's why Oregon was able to beat Ohio State right here in Autzen Stadium, and it's why they were able to jump all over an Illinois team that um, was a little bit shell shocked in the first quarter, and 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 you could see why. Yeah, and and I'll be honest with you, I we talked about this in with Kedrick. I, I get tired of so many people always blaming their team like oh, our coaches stink or our players stink i just thought today oregon was the better team now i'm not saying that illinois couldn't have done things better that's a different right. argument but but i i had a hard time putting together a scenario um barring an injury to dylan gabriel uh, you know i had a hard time putting together a scenario that that oregon would lose this game and I didn't think that was a knock on the Illini at all. I thought it was more accolades for how good the Oregon team is. I mean, Mike, you want me to go there? Our, 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 like, our Aaron Henry threat is stupid. I, I, if, if you want me to call out subscribers right now, I, I, I'm happy to do it on that thread. Our, Aaron, our fire Aaron Henry threat is stupid. It's absolutely stupid. It's stupid for two reasons. One is that I feel like Illinois has played two poor halves of football in, in eight games. In the second half against Purdue and the first half here in Eugene. Um, it is it is so unbelievably better than it was last year in Aaron Henry's first year as a defensive coordinator. And then you add into the fact that Brett Bielema has known Aaron Henry since he was 16 years old, and he's told everybody about as clearly as day as he possibly can that I'm not firing Aaron Henry. So the Aaron Henry thread that is currently on our board is stupid. It's absolutely stupid. And so um, it, it, look, Aaron Henry needs to put his players probably in a more in better and more advantageous situations. Again, like Gabe Yakis doesn't need to be trying to tackle Tez Johnson in the middle of the field. And that's why it's a touch a 30 plus yard touchdown. It's seven, nothing Oregon. But um, I understood the idea of trying to keep Oregon in front of you and maybe trying to get off the field on third down. The problem with that theory was Illinois didn't get off the field on third down. Right. Um, there, Oregon was four for four on third down. Um, the epitome of all that was when Oregon, I think in the second half, if I'm not mistaken, or either it was close to the first half. It's kind of all sinking in at this point. Um, Oregon's got third and 16 near midfield. Um, Illinois can get off the field. They can probably score and then make this a, you know, I mean, at least to the committee, college football committee, a competitive football game. Um, Oregon gets 16 yards on that third and 17 on a screen pass, and then they get the get the first down. That was that was backbreaking. And and two defensive players that we got today said it was backbreaking. Can't happen. But that's not Aaron Henry dialing something up that like, you know, like he, he didn't fall asleep on third and 16 or third and 17. Like, I mean, he wants to keep everybody in front of him. And if Illinois makes open field tackles, Aaron Henry looks great. Illinois yeah. didn't make open field tackles. And Aaron Henry looks like, you know, doesn't know what the hell he's doing. And so, again, I'm trying to figure out like. And on the third level of this thing, which continues to happen, like. The Aaron Henry fire Aaron Henry threat is stupid because Brad Bielema also mentioned that Illinois had, you know, two <laughs> really advantageous situations in the red zone on offense and came away with a grand total of zero points. You cannot do that against the number one team in the country. Those are two point plays that have to be executed properly. Um, you have to be able to get, you know, touchdowns. You cannot get stalled there. You cannot go. You cannot go without points when you get it deep in, in in Oregon territory against the number one team in the country, that was not going to work. Um, and and I'm, I'm here to tell you, I, I, I just it, look, everybody comes away with this trying to figure out what happened before they go to Minnesota. It's not just on Aaron Henry, but I can promise you that the guy that makes almost $7 million a year in the Smith center is not going to fire his defensive coordinator period. End of story. It's not going to happen. Um, 
more or less because the 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 head coach at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign thinks the defensive coordinator in year two has done an unbelievably better job than he did in year one. So um, that that threat is stupid and it needs to stop. Like I'm just telling you. And so um, I don't think Illinois comes away from Eugene thinking that Aaron Henry is 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 really bad at his job. I think Illinois comes away from Eugene going. We didn't tackle well. We didn't pressure Dylan Gabriel. Um, the one thing I will I will contest with the head coach is that he suggested to us that Dylan Gabriel was just not going to allow Illinois to sack him. I'm sorry. There are times that Dylan Gabriel just sat back there and waited for guys to come open and then went, nope, nobody's open. I'm just going to dump it off in the middle of the field. Um, I felt that way, at least, especially when Illinois rushed three. Again, I understand yeah. the idea. I understand. Try to keep everybody in front of you. Hope that Dylan Gabriel makes a mistake because he will throw you a couple um, if you if you let him. Uh, he just didn't today. He did not put the football in 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 situations where until the second half where Illinois could get turnovers. And and then when they did, I thought Illinois made it a much more competitive football game in in, in the second half defensively. And people need to understand something. Illinois outscored Oregon six nothing in the third quarter, and that's not. I'm not trying to like, you know, I'm not trying to do stuff that's going to like roll people's eyes, but Oregon did not sub their starters out after halftime. Like they, they, they yes. played the same game. They played the same, you know, 22 on offense that they were, you know, top 22 on offense that they were playing before. And Illinois made adjustments after halftime that like, you know, looked a heck of a lot better coming out of the tunnel in the third quarter than they did come out of the tunnel in the first quarter. So um, give it, give the defense a lot of credit for at least making this, look like it could have been a competitive situation late in the game. Um, I felt like if, you know, L Illinois could have somehow gotten this to like 35, 16, um, maybe even like 35, 23, by the end of this game, the CFP committee, which doesn't watch every game or God knows, doesn't remember every game by the time the, the final selections are, are revealed going to go, Oh, well, you were competitive. That's good. Your losses are to one and three right now, and you, they were you competitive in this game. Illinois wasn't competitive in this game, and, and, and I feel like that has a lot to do with Oregon being supremely more talented than Illinois, but it also has to do with the fact that Oregon was supremely talented and Illinois probably didn't play great, um, and, and that combination leads it to be 35-3 to three at halftime. This is the Run My Own Business Dream. This is the college's paid for dream. This is the retire early dream. This is Busey, where your dreams and possibilities become moments through trusted guidance and expertise, through lifelong relationships. Because we're here to help you achieve the life you've always envisioned. I do think there was a, a, a challenge with a lot of what was going on with the Illini defense, I thought the Illini offense struggled the whole game. And I don't know that, I don't know that that surprised anybody, but Luke Altmeyer is getting hit too often. And, and he seemed to be a little rattled. Um, again, not a horrible game, but not a good game, especially they needed to be able to provide some points and they just weren't able to do it. And I know like on that fourth down play, it was surprising to me because maybe Oregon was trying to bait them into something, but they had to look like the left center and guard gap were wide open. And I was just shocked. They didn't keep the ball on the ground, but what do I know? Look, Illinois is not, Illinois is not capable and not set up to, you know, throw their way back into a game. And that's essentially what the first right. quarter forced them to do. Um, Luke Altmeyer at that point is going to be under duress because Oregon has very, very fast edge rushers and they're going to come. And then they're, and, and Tosh Depot is going to put his, put his rabbits package on the field, which is basically four edge rushers and no D tackles and say, go get the quarterback. Like, and, and Josh Kruitz, I thought had a really decent game from what I saw, especially in the run game. Cause I thought they ran it through the egg at pretty well. And also did a little lot of counter stuff. That was pretty good, especially with Aiden Loffrey. Um, yep. But I didn't feel like the pass protection was was on point only because, again, because Oregon's just pinning their ears back and, and, and firing. And at that point, Luke's – and Luke missed some stuff. Like, I'm going to be honest with you, nine right. didn't play right. his best game. And, and, and what did I tell you guys on the, on the Illini Sports Spectacular? Your stars have got to play great. Your, your, 
you know, secondary pieces have got to play really, really well, and you've got to get a, a performance out of somebody you weren't expecting. Your their stars didn't play great, and you didn't get a secondary performance out of anybody that was that was worthwhile at that point. Um, and you probably got the third thing out of like a Tyson Rooks or somebody else that's making plays in the second half. So, um, and and a Khalil Valentine who gets his first touchdown in his career. So, you got the third part. You just your stars didn't play great, and your sec and your complimentary pieces didn't have above averages games either. So. Um, I really think that that Illinois, you know, um, the, the line was 21 for a reason. And, and, and Oregon is just significantly better than Illinois right now. And, and you have to force Illinois to come back down to your level, either with turnovers or, you know, the ability to kind of get Oregon um, in a deficit. Um, I thought Illinois gets an early lead. This game's completely different. If Illinois gets off the field, Illinois defense gets off the field on that first drive. Maybe this game's different. You know, momentum is a thing in football. Um, the fact that that Oregon was was three and three on their first drive and they made it seven nothing and then Illinois goes three and out. I'm sitting here and I'm going, oh, this is not good because it, when it snowballs and it's a team like Oregon, that's what happens. Thirty five to three at the half happens, and and when you're Illinois, and and that's that's just the the reality of it right now. Illinois needs to start recruiting more dudes with a capital D, so like they can that they can compete with an Oregon because here's the, here's the crux of this whole thing, Mike, is that we can, we can talk about this all we want to and, and go, well, Illinois is not there yet. You know, it's re, it's a rebuilding thing. And I completely agree. But the minute that Oregon entered this conference, Mike, it became duck hunting season. Like you knew they were going to be at the top level of this conference and, and you got to start hunting them and you got, you got to, you got to play, you got to start recruiting guys that, are going to go and are they going to be capable of going and beating Oregon? If you're Illinois, you have to have that mentality. You have to start recruiting dudes that are capable of going into Columbus and beating Ohio State. You have to start recruiting dudes that are capable of going into Happy Valley and beating Penn State. Illinois is not there yet. And we all know that Illinois is not there yet because we can look at the recruiting stuff and we can look at the portal stuff and go, here's where Oregon is, here's where Illinois is, and it's 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 not at the same tier. So when those teams meet up in 2024 in Eugene, Oregon, one of the toughest places to play, Illinois needs a lot of things to go right to pull that off. And none of it went right in the first 18 minutes. And suddenly it's 28 to three. Yeah. And I, I think it ultimately comes down to, and, and look, thankfully there was a second plane that went that had a lot of Illinois boosters. And hopefully these boosters got a chance to see the path that has been traveled the four years Brett Beal mm -hmm. has been here has been substantial. And then the other half is, is I hope they also figured out that the road forward is substantial and they need to do something to make sure that this team ends up, they're in a place where they get some more dollars because when, when you hear that Oregon's got 20 to 23 million and Illinois has 3 million, that means you're going to have to fundraise more money if you want to win. And I, it's not fair. Life is what it is. But right now, the Oregons, the Ohio States are putting an awful lot of money in winning. Now, Illinois is never going to reach parity with that. I get it. But they've got to try to find a way to give their football coach a little bit more of a chance to win. And if you want to win in football, it comes down to physical talent. Um, yeah. And, and let me cut you off quickly, Mike, is that if I'm Brett Bielema today, I'm glad they saw. I'm glad those people that you're describing saw that. I'm glad they saw what number one in the country looks like. If I'm Brett Bielema, I'm telling them that on the plane going home. I'm getting on that plane before it takes off, and I'm saying, I'm glad you all saw that because that's what number one in the country looks like. That's what a Big Ten champion looks like, and that's where I want to go. And, and I think I can get there. And, and and sometimes, Mike, you need to see it physically yeah. see it and i'm talking about two different things one you need to see what that looks like you need to see what number one in the country looks like if you're a booster and quite frankly mike if you're an illinois player you have to see what that oregon speed looks like you can't simulate it you have to get on the field and see it so you can stop it so you can make that tackle so you can make those plays illinois brett bielema talked about you know i don't think i got this team properly prepared buddy i don't know if you could have until you got on the field and, and saw if you're, you know, 22 on defense, your, 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 your first string and second string, we're going to be able to make plays on these guys. And, and now they, now here's, here's, um, we're at the 25 minute mark and I'm, I'm going to get out of here, but here's the, here's the crux of this whole thing. Now here's where the season lies at this point. We got to figure out, you know, if you're Brett Bielema, you get on the plane and you figure out is Pat Bryant healthy. 
we like that is a total key to this offense right now is that is our number one playmaker in the past game. Um, if it's not Zachary Franklin, it's Pat Bryant. Is he healthy? Because he did not look good, you know, coming out of the locker room. He went straight to the locker room. Brett Bielema said he had no update on any of the guys that got hurt, but he knows that it's a head and it's a it's a head injury with Pat Bryant. Um, and we'll see where it goes. Um, but I, I, look, I mean, that's a significant- so we've so we've been touting this receiver core as being deep. And now it's going to be time to be honest, as Urban Meyer says, next man up, right? Yeah, but there's no next man up that's that's comparable to I, what Pat Bryant can provide. Like, let's just be honest about it. Like, that's that's a significant enough injury that that after what happened today, and the confidence that the Gophers have today, that's that's a problem. Okay, um, so you got to figure that out. You got to figure out what, who's healthy in your secondary right now. Um, because here's the like I said it. Everybody said it before this game kicked off, and then the game kicks off, and everybody kind of goes, oh, "I don't feel good about this." Like, but nothing changed from Thursday to today. Okay, about November. Brett Bielema talks all the time. I'm going to write it on a line. I guys, November is the month to remember. He's big on November. Well, November in 2023 stunk. In 2022, it was worse. Like, and. I don't think he feels good about either one of those years. And Illinois, if they're going to do something spectacular in this season, they have the chance to go 4-0 and in the month of November because they're going to be favored against Minnesota. They're going to be favored against Michigan State. They're going to be favored against Rutgers, and they're going to be favored against Northwestern. That is 10 and 2, folks, if you if 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 Vegas is to be is to be believed. So in order to do that, though, you got to make sure who's healthy and you got to fix these problems. Because well, you're not going to see an Oregon speed, but you can't let – like, I'm going to quote Brett Bielen, we cannot let Oregon beat us twice. And I think that that is so spot on trying to figure out how to how to rally from this, is that these, these are the kind of games now, Mike, where you get so shell-shocked and your head spinning for an entire week that Minnesota scores 48 points today against a Maryland team, I think, and, and, and now they've got confidence and they're coming to Champaign and P.J.'s never beat Brett and Brett's never lost to Minnesota, period. Um you know, th- they think that they can knock Illinois off. Um, and, and you know, maybe this is this is a trap game for Illinois. You you show who you are at this point. So I think we we have a lot of questions like entering Monday uh, uh, for preparation of Minnesota, uh, you know, on this beat about, oh, is Pat Bryant healthy? You know, how's Luke Altmaier doing after, you know, a shaky performance? How's this defense after a shaky performance? Um, you know, is, is everybody in the secondary healthy? I mean, you 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 saw the difference, Mike. I'm going to point this out, like on a on a feature I'm, you're going to see on on, on Sunday um, about the Illinois defense and tackling. I'll point it out to you, Mike. The touchdown run, okay, where um, Whittington just absolutely trucks Miles Scott. Not going to talk about that. Miles Scott is standing on the goal line. I got news for everybody. That kid was going to score no matter what Miles Scott did. Right. Unfortunately, that young man in orange and white is going to be on a whole lot of highlights, for, and, and I feel bad for him. But I'll I'll, I'll give him a whole lot of credit. He stood in front of us and talked after, after afterwards today. Um, that kid's got a, that kid's got a lot of stones to 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 do that. After that play is going to be on every highlight reel known to God's green earth in the United States of America. That's not my point. My point is, Mike, what happened in the play before that? Matt Bailey's helmet pops off, okay, and he's got to go sit and stand next to Aaron Henry. What is what is Will Stein, the offensive coordinator at Oregon, do? He does a simple gap play through the a hole, through the a gap, because guess what? Number seven in a white jersey is not there anymore, and he just runs unabated until he gets to the goal line and Miles Scott. Um, so, I'm thinking number seven might have filled that hole. Number seven might have filled that gap in in the run, and and maybe Oregon doesn't get a touchdown like right there. Um, so those are the things that Illinois defense has got to figure out is is that how do we get our 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 guys on the same page? every play of this game because when Mac Rasidich goes into that game and he's not filling the gap that Matt Bailey should have would should have and would have filled that's the kind of things that happen a 18 to 20 yard touchdown run just like that because that's what elite teams do that's what elite coaches do that's what elite players do sometimes it's just that easy of a matchup game and and so um Illinois has got to regroup and they've got to figure out a way to go one and zero on November 2nd 
because Mike, if they go number one, if they go one and zero on November second, you're going to hear their name called on on election night when ESPN does the show. And at that point, Illinois, I think, still in the college football playoff discussion. Um, you know, at, at, at the possibility of being ten and two with their only losses being Penn State and Oregon. Nothing changed from when I talked to you about this after the Michigan game to today in that regard, because I, I, I guess I, I, I picked Illinois to lose 31 to 10 today. So I didn't think that unless Illinois pulled off what would have probably been the biggest upset in the program's modern day history um, coming into Austin Stadium and winning, that Illinois was going to be anything other than six and two coming out of this game. And they still have a shot to be 10 and two. So um and I'm going to leave you with that is that I think Illinois still has so much more on the table, especially when you consider the way that November ended in 2022 and November ended in 2023. These guys don't want to go through that again for a third straight year. And I know darn good and well because he's made his career off of winning Big Ten titles because he dominated the final month of the season. Brett Bielema doesn't want to go through a third straight year where they are just abs- they absolutely crumble in the final month of the season. So we're going to learn a lot about what Illinois is in the final month of this 2024 season. So quick two minute answer. You've seen sure. you've seen two of the three best teams in the Big Ten live. Mm-hmm. What order is it? Oregon, Penn State, or Penn State, Oregon? Uh I, I like Oregon, Penn State as the order because I think Oregon has more speed. And I think Oregon is set up defensively to handle anybody. I don't know if Penn State has enough speed on offense, especially on the perimeter or on defense on the perimeter to handle um, Oregon speed. I I just, I, I, I I fully expect the number one, if they if they continue to roll like this, and I don't see any reason why they wouldn't Oregon to roll into Indianapolis. And, and, and then you're, I think again, Mike, what did I tell you guys in in the summer months? I thought Oregon and Ohio state were going to play three times this year. I think Oregon and Ohio state are going to play three times this year. I think Indiana going to be able to match up with Ohio state. Yeah, I think so. I mean, because boy, yeah. they've only got one tough game on their schedule. It, my it problem with that one. game, Mike, quickly is my problem with that game is I believe it's in Columbus, yes. and, and that's going to be a problem. Beating Ohio State in the shoe when they're properly prepared for an IU team is going to be a problem because I think they thought they could walk through Nebraska today, and they almost got clipped. I don't right. think they're going to think they're going to walk, through, especially with the comments that Sig's been making all year long. Um, and for the last five months since he took yeah. the freaking job at Indiana, I don't think Ohio State's going to walk in there sleepwalking through Indiana. Um, and, and if Ohio State can put it to Indiana, I think they're going to. Um, but I think I think Ohio State and Oregon are going to play three because I think Ohio State's going to beat Penn State, too, um, because I think they just have more dudes. And I think um, and I think that, you know, I know I know you have an issue with. Ryan Day. I think Ryan Day is a is a is a is just as capable a coach as James Franklin um, to win a game like that. And I think that um, I think I think there's also an added element to Penn State believes they can beat Ohio State. Ohio State knows they can beat Penn State. And, right. and there's there's still there's an element to that. Um, so I think Oregon and Ohio State are going to play three times. I think they're going to play in Indy and I think they're going to play in the playoff again. Um, and I, I, I that's that's what the top tier of the Big Ten looks like right now. I don't even think Penn State, they keep winning. Um, and, and look, you're going to see my, if I had a top 25 ballot column come out, there are teams, Mike, nationally where I don't know what to do with them because they just keep winning. <laughs> specifically BYU, specifically Iowa State, specifically um, you know teams like Clemson, where I don't think they're great, but they keep winning. Um, so what do I do with them, right? Yeah. And so um, I think the top tier of the Big Ten is Oregon and Ohio State. And I don't even think Penn State's there, except they keep winning. So if Penn right. State keeps winning, they're, they're going to get to that top tier, and they have a shot to, to prove me wrong. Hell, I picked them to win the league last year, and we all saw how that worked. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, look, the idea here is I, I think Ohio State has and Oregon have too many dudes for the rest of the guys in this league. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that you know, there's a possibility that Oregon and Penn State could see each other in Indy as well. And I think that that – that's going to be, and I think who wins that game, Mike, is the number one seed in the playoff. And, and, yeah. and at that point, you're sitting there and you're 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 trying to figure out, you know, which one of those teams is national championship caliber. Um, and and you know, if you look at it, like I said before, I started this thing. 
if you're Illinois and you're looking at Oregon right now, they are so far in front of you in their development. Um, but you can't lose sight of the fact that you've come so far um, since August 1st in your development of where of where you were um, starting fall camp and maybe even starting spring ball is that, you know, um, I think Illinois has made an extreme amount of progress with the development of the guys that they have. Now they need to go get more dudes because you saw the difference of guys with speed out in space, you know, trying to play in Illinois defense, trying, trying to tackle them. It, it, some, a lot of the times it just does not go well. Um, and if Illinois can't, you know, make those tackles so that a majority of the game might, people need to understand this. There was, it, there's a point in which for 60 minutes, if you're Oregon and Illinois continues to make those tackles, like in the first half and you're getting off the field and Illinois is controlling the football at some point, Illinois, if they're talented enough and, and, and they're, they're disciplined enough can play this game in the mud, you know, play this game in the proverbial mud, play this game in the phone booth and make it a Brett Bielema type game. It's why teams like Ohio State and, and Oregon, for that matter, they haven't gone yet, but like in a Penn State, when they go to Iowa City and Iowa drags them into the proverbial mud for like a 15 to 12 game or like whatever it is, like when you know what I'm talking about, like yep. that's what Illinois needs to be able to do. But you cannot do that unless you recruit dudes like on, on the line of scrimmage and out on the perimeter that can go make tackles. Um, that's right. what Iowa does. Iowa's got NFL guys in the secondary uh, right now that they recruit. Like they send N- they send secondary guys in the NFL. You know, Cooper DeGene is in the NFL right now, right? Um, so that's what Illinois needs to start doing. They, they've 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 sent and I know people are going to yell are yelling at me right now. Well, Devin Witherspoon and Quan Martin and Sidney Brown are in the NFL. That was two years ago, right? And, and so. Um, you know, they need to, they, Mac, Mac Resetic isn't ready to go to the NFL right now. Nobody thought he should be based off of where his development is, but, but you need to start recruiting dudes that can get, that can, that can play at the level of, of an Oregon and an Ohio state and a Penn state so that you can get those games into the fourth quarter and prove you're a physically more, uh, more intimidating football team. Because when you do that, that's when Brett Bielema's teams win those types of games. Um, that's how he did it at Wisconsin. And that's how he won big games early on at Arkansas, too. So that's that's what Illinois struggled to do because you cannot do that, Mike, when you suddenly look up at the board and it's 28 to 3. And that's not how Illinois – That I mean, that's how nobody can beat the yeah. number one team in the country. But that's certainly not how Illinois can beat the number one team in the country because they're just not set up to do something like that. Excellent. Well, I tell you what, Matt, thanks for getting on. We appreciate that. He's out in Oregon. He'll have a variety of articles over the next three days covering this game. So uh, if you certainly, if there's ever a time to subscribe to Illini guys, 27 cents a day. And of course, we'll have a podcast tomorrow talking about the scrimmage at Old Miss. So we try to stay in front of you. It's all how much your eyes can stomach. That's something that we you know we can't control um and while i'm on a cross-country flight y'all enjoy that so yeah uh, i appreciate it you guys have a good one and i will see you guys later on this weekend appreciate it mike so uh you get the opportunity subscribe to illini guys and that will give you uh everything that you need uh, to follow illinois so if you're looking to have a fun time and you want to enjoy your fandom with the uh fighting illini we're the place to be 27 cents a day. We haven't raised our prices since we started in the middle of the pandemic. Who's dumb enough to start a business in the middle of the pandemic? Uh, so we're, we're there and ready for you. Uh, and we would also encourage you, you can get Eye on the Illini. Of course, you can subscribe to it at almost any podcast distributor. Please do that so you won't miss an episode. You can also subscribe to the Illini Guys Sports Spectacular. That's our weekly two-hour sports show that's Illini centric comes out on Fridays, Thursdays or Fridays. And uh, you can either listen to it on the radio or download it as a podcast. Same thing with our big 10 show, big sports radio. And of course on Sunday nights, Monday nights, I do a Mike Kegley's heat checks and hail Mary's where I talk about things that have happened usually with big 10 and Illinois implications, but I will throw in, guy stuff like movies tv 
wrestling, all sorts of things. But we'd love to have you be a part of that as well. And you can get a, a lot of our stuff on our IlliniGuys.com YouTube channel. And there's a lot to be had. And certainly we try to keep it positive. We try to have fun with everything. We do not want to add to your consternation. There's plenty of other media outlets that can make you angry, make you upset. We try not to do that. We try to have a good time. That's why you don't see us on the algorithm a lot because we're not bitching and moaning about things. But I, we think you'll enjoy it. Please come and join us. Uh, until tomorrow, go Illini.